Okay, we should be live on YouTube now. And what I've got to see is uh, how to make it full screen. So we're supposed to start at 2015. Okay, I'm not sure how this is coming through on YouTube, but we'll go ahead and get started. So, so here we are again. This is the uh, August. Mecca Sky Tour booklet. We published the first video of this back in uh, last month and went over fairly thoroughly. Last month was really a good month for this sky. Lots of things to see in the 4th of July, 7th of July, and later in the month. Uh, so this is on August. And you can still see both of those things relatively well. Uh, the date that we're published in, like the 4th of July, is a collimation date. That's the date at which that constellation or object should be at 90 degrees above you and your latitude and longitude at the zenith. And then uh, as the days go by, it will move further and further uh, away. So is it to the east or west, depending on how you're set up. So you still see them for about uh, 30 days at least. There's about 90 days to the cycle of it coming up uh, in our east. And then hitting the zenith on that date that we are uh, posted on the uh, booklet. And that's the collimation time. That's the time, as I said, it's 90 degrees above you at the zenith. And that time should be at astronomical midnight, which is when the sun is 18 degrees below your horizon. So anyway, let's get on with the uh, August one. And uh, we'll have to make some changes here. And there we go. Now you should be seeing the August schedule. And you'll find that the August time frame is quite a bit different. So whatever the reasons are, based on the celestial uh, locations, many of these are going to be in the southern hemisphere, and we're in the northern hemisphere. So basically, uh, a lot of these uh, are going to be hard to see, 
and some of them we may not even see, but these are coming from a book that was published for Good Union of Constellations, and that one by Cambridge Press. So the first one you see there, August the Force is Microscope Cam. These are, say, some of the newer ones that have been named after uh, modern day items, so it's microscope and uh, then one for a telescope, uh, and various things will be in there as they come up with this August 4th. So let's just go through the booklet to some extent you'll see. And here, where we're at in central Texas, we can't see anything below minus 59. So this uh, constellation we will not be able to see. So we'll just go quickly through them because we're primarily interested in Texas and Texas followers. There's August 8th. And this one you can see is not too bad. This one is uh, right around the equator. Now, if you go to the next page, that's the diagram of the constellation and the property of that constellation in the sky, uh, along with your uh, three stick figure and uh, information, at least titles, labeling on uh, stars and uh, constellations. And on the, these pages, you'll see interesting information such as uh, there is a this year 30 that can be seen. And the other information, such as the altitude and longitude, neighboring constellations, things that might be of importance to you, and then things of uh, interest in text format. They come up with August 12th. Okay, this is the little horse. Equinus and the little horse again is visible to us. It's at minus 10. I'm sorry, plus 10. So we can see it here. There's not a lot to see in it. It is not a very favorite one or popular one. There's August 12th, the Indian, Indios. And that again, we will probably not see that one is at minus 40 degrees. So you can see that very near the South Pole. If you go down to the bottom here, you'll see the South Pole. So, and as we keep going through the months, it's August 25th, so we're almost through the month, so you can see there's not a whole lot to see. This is our Aquarius. Not too long ago, we had a uh, New York stage play and the music uh, that was very popular, The Dawning of Aquarius. And there's Aquarius, and you can see it's sitting right on the equator, a little bit above and a little bit below. And there's the information on it. Aquarius is a water bearer. There you can see some of the bright stars. We'll go over sometimes the magnitude of what a bright star is and how it's discussed. And there we are. In Aquarius, we've got uh, um, looks like M2 to 9, which is what they're calling the butterfly nebula. So the numbers are the numbers of the SCR catalog. Um, the device one, I believe. And then these other names have been given over a period of time because it looked like that. Since it's a spiral galaxy, looks like a spiral. Rain looks like a rain, dumbbell looks like a dumbbell, and so on. So, and there we don't look a lot at clusters because we just not that much into it. It's into 22, and that's also in the same constellation. Now, 
Silicon to August 25th, Pisces Australis. And you can see again, we're very down near the southern equator at minor 20. So that's another one that we will not see in temple section. There's the information on it. So probably it's not of a lot of interest academically in the United States. Here's August 28th, Bruce, the crane. And this one is also from minus 40, minus 50. So I may be leading you astray there a little bit because this goes, I uh, was thinking uh, 50 to 90. We see things as far as minus 59. And uh, then below from 59 to 90, minus 90, so the closer you to the equator. So some of these we can see part of. This one we can see it all, it looks like, because it's right close to the edge of getting close to the minus 59. So, but again, depending on where you live, in the city with skyscrapers or with houses with trees, you probably won't see a lot of these. And then we come up with a third on August 28th. And the third top of it is at plus 50. So that means we're going to see the circuit. And you can see it's right there between the royalty in the sky. There's Cassiopeia on the left, who's the queen of the royalty. And on the right is Cephas, who is the king called the royalty of the sky. And then you have Andromeda, the princess. Below there, so you don't uh, see her here. You see a little bit of Pegasus. So anyway, uh, we're getting near the end. It's from a certain the wizard. So here we come with our moon landings and uh, we always said this because we're tied in now to the Armatus uh, program, which is a follow up to Paul, which was done when I was younger, 1960s and early 80s. And there's a Paul 11 site. That's where we put a man on the moon. Paul 15, where we first put a vehicle on the moon. And you can see that they're all in the Northern Hemisphere. So right now, Armatus is going to take an opposite trip around the uh, latitude and longitude of the moon. It's going to go from the North Pole to the South Pole, and it's going to land at the South Pole on the Southern Hemisphere. And they just came up fairly recently with a good uh, map of the moon showing uh, where they have found water. So just a matter of interest for this August, uh, right now the country India has a uh, moon rocket up and they're going to land on the moon somehow later this month. I'm not sure what the date is, but you can find there right now good pictures, beautiful pictures, high quality, high resolution pictures of the moon on YouTube from that. And as it circles the moon. So it'll be landing, they think, also on the South Pole. So maybe it's just one up on us that they'll have something on the South Pole before we do. So there's 11, and here is what we're going to come up with is our moon map that we go over. We try to get everybody to learn from the next lunar eclipse at least 10 figures, some in the middle, some in the east and west, or north and south. So there's a top one that's the easiest one to begin with for Gorse. For Gorse, most of these names are in Latin. Uh, so we can call it the Chia Cone or Maria for Gorse. 
And then we come down where we did land, and you'll see Maria Chuck and Fred Quiliatis and Siri Tatis. That's where Apollo 11 and 15 landed. And over the right side, there you see Maria um, Chrysium, or in English, Chrysum. And then on the left side, there you see the ocean. Um, and it's big. So, and then way over here, you see Gibaldi. And then down at the bottom, you'll see Tycho. So these are some that you should try to learn and visualize the moon and see if you can find these when you have a full moon or any moon, uh, but you won't see them all unless you have a full moon. And you'll be able to see those on the left side, down the middle, and on the right side. And we'll go back here because again, what we're getting ready for here, tomorrow night, we're gonna do another test transfer like this. And tomorrow night, we're gonna be doing the uh, full moon moon party, virtual moon party. So we'll be trying again, probably around 10 o'clock if anybody wants to get on live on YouTube. As I said, we're still testing all these things, building a system primarily uh, for when uh, um, eclipses are coming here. We'll have two eclipses. The first one is in October. And that's going to be called the rain and fire because it's an annual eclipse. And then in April of next year, we'll have a complete total eclipse. So that's going to be a really big deal from the standpoint of uh, people coming into the city and through this whole area, all the way from Texas, all the way up to uh, Canada. So people are going to come in and spend the night and in hotels and uh, there'll be lots of activities going on. Uh, that's on a school night or school day. And the one in November, October is on a Saturday. So our young people will be out of school. So there probably won't be as much activity uh, for that one, but uh, we'll hear in Texas because San Antonio, Texas is one of the ideal spots to see that. And it's a fairly ideal spot for April 2, uh, but they might have to move a little bit outside the city to have a, a complete uh, totality. So anyway, we're gonna try tomorrow night at around 10 o'clock because we've gotta to wait till the moon gets up at least uh, about 10, 20% above the horizon. And we'll be testing it uh, from the two locations in Killeen and in Copper's Cove. And we'll be trying to tie in uh, the dwarf uh, two telescopes. Uh, so right now, uh, we can only do four inputs. It looks like we need to upgrade our equipment so that if we want to do Stellarium and other things in here, such as the um, um, computer and the tablet and uh, the or phone, and the phone will have on it uh, the uh, software to run remotely the dwarf, and then still area on maybe the second computer. As say we, we need more inputs, and uh, we'll be working on that as we go forward here. We're just getting ready for this school year, so we'll be trying to tie into some of the schools here. So that pretty much wraps up the August. And I do want to say you still can see pretty much everything for July. So I'm going to read for you a little bit out of a book that's worth having for those of you who are following a lot of this type of activity. It's called Messier Marathon. It's out of print, but you can still buy it as a huge book. 
but what they've done is they made it easy to follow throughout the year where these are. They've done it with uh, uh, view, uh, viewfinders and uh, two different types, Telluride and a regular optical finder. And then they give you the mapping. So I'm going to go over the one that uh, is most interesting and spend time on. A marathon marathon means you identify that many mystery objects, generally speaking, from sundown of one day to sunup of the next day. So it's something like uh, um, the radio people have their uh, field days where they try to contact people from around the world and so on, all over a weekend. So anyway, I walk over here in this book, it's got three pages on Sagittarius. So. Sometime we may have time to go ahead and make copies of these or get this book. I can't get a uh, digital copy of it, but so uh, we may be able to digitize it ourselves. So. So I'm looking there on Sagittarius. And what I want to do is take a walk around Sagittarius a little bit. And it starts right above what, generally speaking, is called the teapot. Okay. I'm getting the book up so I can read it here. Okay, and right above the teapot, you'll see three of them. You could see almost with one viewer, if not two viewers overlapping. So you hardly have to move it at all. So if you see one, more than likely you'll be able to find the other. And that is M8, that's your eight, that's your 20. And this year, 21. Now, for whatever reason, as you move up and to the left, further over, you'll be able to see this year, 23, 24, and 25. And you'll have two separate, but if you just keep going left um, above the teapot again, that's the uh, point of the teapot goes right through the middle one, you'll be able to see three more. So man, this is not, not bad viewing for a marathon. You can actually do a marathon just around Sagittarius. And then as you move over a little bit, uh, this one is actually, uh, Actually closer, but close to the same location. If you make arrows or diagonals from uh, the teapot, this is this year 22, this year 28. Uh, interesting, it didn't come out in an order where it just go right on down. And then we have, as you move further over, to the other side of the uh, Sagittarius, you're going to have Miss Lear 54, 69, and 70. And these are not, should not be too hard to find either. So all you kind of have to do is go around the top, the side, start up the side of the teapot, Sagittarius. And then we got one lone guy over here. This year, 55. And another one, this year, 75. Put that book away. And then we'll come back.
And what you see there is the back of a t-shirt. We are in Central Texas, and this is one of our small towns uh, close to us uh, in Lampasas County, and it's Lampasas uh, City. So they are trying to become a dark sky city. We have two or three of them already in Texas. One is south of Austin. And uh, this one now is trying to become a dark sky city and therefore get people to come in there for astronomy. Uh, we do have uh, Marble Falls that's got uh, a good place to go for astronomy and they have a telescope that you can use. Uh, you can go in with your camper, your RV, your RV and stay there and have sessions. I presume they'll be doing something for the eclipse. So these people are advertising strong uh, for the eclipse to get people in there. It's one of the ideal locations. Uh, and then as you go up from them, about uh, maybe 40 miles, we have Pearl, Texas. So if you're interested in bluegrass music, uh, they may have a bluegrass session. They have it once a month, the first Saturday of the month, a uh, bluegrass session going all day. And people come in with their campers and their RV vehicles, RV vehicles and uh, participate in uh, many jam sessions and so on. So uh, they're also booking now for the eclipse. And I'm uh, not sure if they decided, but they were going to add. Um, Monday to it. A lot of people come in on Thursday night, they're there Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and then they go back to work on Monday. So for the eclipse, uh, at least they were talking about adding in Monday to that and keep jam sessions going. So uh, it'd be good in that uh, here in Central Texas, anywhere. Uh, you can go around to various places from San Antonio uh, to Central Texas here to Waco to Dallas, and you can participate in uh, uh, the Eclipse events. Locally, our closest smaller city, Copper's Cove, is going to have a two-day event in Oval Tree Gap. Oval Tree Gap is an old Indian trading post. Uh, and uh, they use it now as a uh, city outdoor event uh, uh, park, and it's got a pavilion, and uh, they will be having a two-day festival there, so more than likely we'll be going to that too. We may try to bring you some video on those nights, so I don't know if uh, we can do it or not, but we may try on each of the nights of the Eclipse at around 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock seems to be an ideal time for Americans to do astronomy. Midnight is still is probably better, uh, but uh, a lot of our young people and older also don't want to stay up that late. So anyway, um, that's pretty much covers uh, August. Gives you an idea of what to do. I'm going to show you the uh, book, pick it up, and show it to the camera. And it should be coming on. Once I see it on YouTube, then I can tell when it's uh, good. So what I'll do is just put it on right back. So, and you'll be able to see it. Uh, this is a book of this here marathon that I would highly recommend for beginners to use. Okay, there you go. This here marathon. And it said it's got very nice uh, drawings to make it simple for a beginner to find something in the sky. So we usually recommend that our beginners start working with. Uh, uh, the royalty to sky because it's here, it's circumpolar, and it's easy to find some very identifiable ones such as the asterisms 
little dipper, big dipper, okay, or for minor or for major, but it's easier for them to find the dipper. And then Cassiopeia and also um, um, Cephas. And then we have Draco, which is not too hard to find because he sprung all over the place. And then sometimes if you work at it, you'll be able to find Camelipus. So we'll get rid of that. And that seemed to work well. It showed up in the camera. So that's about it for today. So again, we're going to give this another try tomorrow on YouTube Live. And again, we will be maybe talking about it tomorrow. We found a good site. One of the problems with all uh, this astronomy is the weather. So you do have to understand and find ways to anticipate and know what's going on with the weather. So uh, we found a way in the last couple of things based on our research for the eclipses. And we'll be talking a little bit more about weather and astronomy. We did have a group out at a good site from a high school for Haley's Comet, and it was cloudy. So we did not see any comments. So you do have to have some plans for if you don't see it. Now we've lucked out because we have uh, uh, a lot of this online. Astronomy is all over the uh, uh, United States and world. Uh, we'll be having live sessions. So you'll be able to see it from different locations actually from the two different hemispheres of the Southern Hemisphere and the Northern Hemisphere uh, on your computer screen. So, and you can project those in buildings on walls. So you can actually see it may be a little bit better than you would if you were there. Um, most of our sports people who go to football games sometimes uh, barely see the field and we see it very well on TV in our houses. So anyway, the technology is here to help us uh, and so on. So we'll be testing more as we go for that. Pretty fun. Well, sums it up for today. So hopefully once we get all this going, we'll be doing these with a chat so people can talk. But I have to get another person here to help us. And tomorrow we're going to be trying it with two people uh, on and I'm not sure if we're going to do a meeting or a webinar. It kind of depends on the learning curve for us. Uh, and then uh, as we move forward, we will be doing, hopefully, with the dwarf tube telescope, which is unbelievable what that thing will do. And the price, how cheap it is. We are recommending a lot of people buy it uh, and do not buy binoculars, do not buy a telescope, and definitely do not buy um, glasses. So they're still going to be available by the dozens and so on, but a lot of people are not going to learn how to when to use them and how to use them. And we'll be going over a lot of that and these sessions here on um, what technology is available and how to use it before to learn um, during each of the sessions of the uh, uh, eclipses and afterwards. So anyway, that's a wrap for today. So we're gonna fade to black and hopefully uh, see some of you again next uh, time, which will be tomorrow at 10 o'clock.